Dr. Vanessa Sinclair and this is Rendering Unconscious. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Todd McGowan about his chapter on Signification of the Phallus from the book Reading Lacan's Ecree from Signification of the Phallus to Metaphor of the Subject edited by Stin Van Hule, Derek Hook, and Callum Neal published by Rutledge 2019. <laughs> okay, because I've t- taken so many notes on this chapter that I don't really know where to start. If we, we could either start kind of where you started, or we could start where Lacan started. I mean, I just love this statement. We know the unconscious castration complex functions as a not. Yeah. I love that he started with that. I know. It's a great beginning. Yeah. I mean, it also is not where you would think. I think I say this in the essay. Mm-hmm. It's not where that you would think an essay on the phallus would begin. So, I mean, in, in a certain way, it's an essay on castration, I think. Right. You know. So, I don't know. I, th- so I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah, exactly. And how you talk about how he kind of reinvents the castration complex and the phallus. Right. Both of them. I think in this essay, I think that's why I mean, I do say that this essay maybe has an outsized importance, but I think maybe that's wrong because it is true that both of those. This is the main place that that reinvention outside of his seminars. It's the main decree in which that reinvention of both phallus and castration gets accomplished. So I think that's pretty I mean, that just speaks its importance to me. Do you think that's why they, like, do you know why they chose to start the book with this essay? I really have no idea about that. It seems strange because I think maybe it was just because, I don't know if this is true, but I got mine done really quickly. So maybe it's just like they had these essays in and then they decided to do it that way. But I really don't know. But because like the the, the second one isn't like the, the, the in memory of Ernest Jones. So that can't be, it can't be in order of what they think the importance is because right. that, no one would say that's the second most important essay and so. it's not chronological right right so there's really i don't know what the logic is actually i'll have to ask one of the editors then yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm so inspired by these volumes that i want to interview all of the authors about their chapters oh, that'll then, be terrific yeah, yeah and make it yeah make talks about all of them and then uh, I already interviewed Steen, but I want to interview Derek and Callum too. Yeah, because they, I think, yeah, I mean, so did Steen, he didn't, he didn't talk about the order. I didn't you know? think to ask him because I hadn't had the book yet. I interviewed him before I actually had the book in hand. I had ordered it, but I didn't have it yet. Is this the only volume that's out so far? I think it is. Right? I think number two either just came out or is about to come out, but okay. this is the only one I have so far. I hope I get free copies of the other ones too. <laughs> Girls I would hope the so. Yeah. Author yeah, copies of, of the collection. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then I wasn't able to go to the first conference because I was moving. And then the next one is coming up already in October. So I'm not going to be there. But the third one, I think, is going to be in Scotland uh, oh, where, that's... where Callum is. So I definitely want to go to that next year. Yeah, the next one is in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and Duquesne because of Derek. Yeah. Seems yeah. appropriate to have one yeah. in each of their home right. bases. So the first one was in... In Ghent. Is Steve, where does he teach? At Ghent University. At Ghent, okay. Mm-hmm. And that's where the first one was. Mm-hmm, exactly. Okay. So you weren't at the first one. I was not at the first one. I will be at the second one. Now, okay, so. good. <laughs> but I'm not talking about that. Decree. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Something totally. Yeah. Different. Well, is your book on identity politics out yet? No. Okay. Because no. I feel like but, I need uh, to read that after reading this. I feel like they're going to go together somehow. I Am think I they do. <laughs> you no, know, no, no. They do because well, the focus on castration is that's definitely a big part of the notion of what's universal. So I, the identity politics is also about asserting universality in terms of lack. And so that's tied to castration for sure. And then, you know, I, I love the way that, I mean, I never thought that this, I never thought about this until I read 
you know, read the essay really closely, but I love the way that it's toward the end of it that Lacan nicely show tries to offer an explanation for why displays of virility are inverted in the human world. The way, you know, like in the animal world, it's only males that display virility and in the female in the sorry, in the human world, it's only it, not only, but it's primarily women. And so I think that, you know, that I always find it weird that students will immediately flock to this evolutionary psychological explanation of human behavior. And I think Lacan nicely shows how it flips and it's flipped in his mind precisely due to the phallus as signifier. And so I think that's I'm just a long way of answering that question. It's tied to so idea identity politics and the way in which our identity, something about our identity is always uprooted or, or, or alienated through the signifier. So a, identity is always a, a bespeaks alienation, not what we really are. And I think that's a key I think that gets developed in this essay pretty nicely. And I think that's a, I mean, that's also a key for me in the, in the identity politics book. No, exactly. And I really feel like psychoanalysis, I mean, I feel like psychoanalytic discourse has such a place with like the current discourse with identity politics and queer theory and just kind of everything that's going on in this huge shift that's happening kind of social culturally. Um, and so I really want to be able to, get psychoanalytic ideas out there as much as possible. And you talk a little bit about, um, actually you make a, quite a great argument about um, like psychoanalysis and feminism and Julia Mitchell and Jacqueline Rose's book on feminine sexuality and how they, they talk about the same thing that Lacan kind of reinventing um, the idea of the phallus helps align psychoanalysis with fem feminist discourse rather than having them be like opposed as so right. many people like read it. Um, and I wonder, like, what do you think about like Judith Butler's argument and then Joan Kopchak? Like you definitely like talk about their arguments with each other, but kind of what is, where do you, what do you think? Where do I come down? I come down to <laughs> Joan's side. I think, I think um, it's, you know, what's fascinating about that debate that they had. So I also think a link is, I mentioned this briefly, I think, of mm -hmm. the discussion in Odd One In, and then it's this her book, What Is Sex, came out after this essay came out. So I would have talked about that if, if it had been out before. But I also think she does a really good job of 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 aligning the psychoanalytic take on the phallus with feminism. And so I think that's really good. But about Jones thing, it's pretty interesting that Ju I, I just think this is a sign of the efficacy of of Joan's argument that Judith Butler has never once said Joan Kopchak's name in public. <laughs> and I think it's because I don't see, and I've talked to Joan about this a lot, extensively and she thinks it's her, it's her most airtight essay and argument that she's ever produced. And I think it's true. And, and so I think Judith Butler hasn't responded precisely because I don't think there's anything to say that, that the notion of, of, construction i think that joan nicely shows the way in which construction is is there to fill in the gap of the antinomies of sex and i think that's pretty i think it's i think that's right and it's pretty clearly shown and i i think it's when you said and i, I really like this point that you made that psychoanalysis offers a different way to understand the contemporary configuration politically culturally and i think it's interesting that it's 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 sort of a third way between the biological explanation and the culturalist explanation. Mm -hmm. And I think that this essay maybe makes that clearer than anything else that Lacan wrote. Yeah. And you make it clear by commenting well, on yeah, it. Because <laughs> <laughs> your essay is much more readable than his, I think, for most I know, people. Like, I think it's pretty hard, <laughs> don't you think? Like, yeah. I think it's not that easy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and a lot I, of the times he packs a big idea into just one or two sentences. Yeah, that's the thing. David Lichtenstein has a, a reading group that meets once a month in New York, and I, I did that group for, I don't know, five years or so. And uh, this is one of the papers that we read, and we would read, like, just a few sentences and then talk about them for, like, an hour, you know? <laughs> like, everything is so rich. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree totally. And I, I mean, I spent, I can't tell you how long I spent sort of pouring through it and coming up with stuff, you know, just to speak of the richness of one of the Acre, you know, Adrian Johnston got this assignment from the three of them and he 
in working on his essay, he ended up, it got so long that he ended up publishing it as a separate book and mm. then a short version of the essay. So, I mean, I can see how that happened. You could get kind of carried away because there's so much the fecundity of every line, just like you say, like you could have an hour or a, a 10 page discussion of a single sentence. Exactly. So I think there's that's... so much to unpack in each sentence, which makes it yeah. maybe that's why Lacan spoke more than he wrote. <laughs> I know, I know. And it also, the, I mean, I just, if I was, I would never, ever teach this. That's, I mean, I would almost never teach any a cre. I just would teach a seminar. It's mm -hmm. like there's so much more accessible. Yeah, so they really are. I think that's kind of interesting. And it, although I think some of the things he says here, I'm not sure get reproduced fully in any seminar. So that's also kind of, I mean, so it definitely has its own worth apart from the seminar. Yeah, and Adrian just gave a talk about that to, to Umbahagen in New York, I don't know, a few weeks ago, and they recorded it, and it's up online on the site, so I definitely want to listen to that soon. And that's on the Acre. What Acre did he, I forgot what he wrote. Uh, the it's, Freudian thing, right? I, that's what it is. Yeah. It's Freudian thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah um, there's so much. So, A Language of Pantrick's book, The Odd One In, isn't that such a treasure? It's a, it's a great book, yeah. It's yeah. such a treasure of a book. I found so many things in there that I've, like, used in other essays and things like that. She has such I know. great, it's so like, spontaneous broke. ideas. Yeah, it's so baroque, don't you think? Like, it covers so many different things, all under the guise of t being about comedy. <laughs> we got it because Manya, Manya had that conference on comedy uh, a few years back, and so we were, like, collecting all the books on kind of comedy. And then there was so much more in that book. <laughs> yeah, you know, it goes so far beyond comedy. In fact, I said to her, the last time I talked with her, I said... You know, I think it'd be worthwhile because this gets pursued a little bit in what is sex, but not really for her to really develop that psychoanalysis and feminism, that conjunction that she first identifies an odd one in and then sort of develops a little bit further. And I she she liked that idea. But I mean, who knows what she's going to do? But I, I really think that would be a great thing. I don't know if that's what she what her what her, she's passionate about now. Yeah, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interview her soon for this podcast, so we'll find out what she's working yeah, yeah. on. <laughs> okay, I want to make sure I get to things. I start a bunch of things in your essay. Okay. <laughs> um, so we can kind of go in order of what you talk about, and that'll make sense. Um, okay, I love this point. This continues Lacan's preoccupation with significance and the symbolic order, as well as his polemics against those psychoanalysts who fail to take up the signifier into account and thereby reduce psychoanalysis to a relationship of duality. Let's talk about that. Okay, so I think in a certain way, all the emphasis on phallus and Lacan is about the triple, the third, the figure of the third. Right. Mm -hmm. So he wants to establish he wants to say that not only in the psycho, I mean, I think he wants to introduce that into the psychoanalytic session, obviously, but also into every understanding of cultural, social dynamics. And I think I, 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 I my sense is that his main so in, in psychoanalysis, he has certain targets, maybe everybody else he's targeting us other than Freud. But in in theory and philosophy, I think it's Sartre is his main antagonist here. So Sartre, for Sartre, very much, it's about dual relationships, like the the self and the other. And I think for Lacan, that third party, which he gets, I think this is the influence of structuralism, really. So Levi Strauss was inc incredibly important on him just right around this time. And so I think that's part, he's importing that into psychoanalysis. And I think that figure of the third just completely reshapes how we think about every kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because then, I, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, and that, and that, that, that the third is the signifier and the phallus is the, is the signifier that stands in for all signifiers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's really what I feel like people need to understand. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. Too. How do we help them understand? I don't, <laughs> I mean, it's, I think it's a tough question because it's, it's so, I think this is why the term imaginary is really important because it, it captures how 
that it's so present as an image for us that there's a dual, it's just a dual relation because we're just talking to the, like, it seems like even when I'm talking to you right now, that it's a dual relation because I'm looking at you on the screen, you're looking at me. Uh, although it's the third party is maybe more evident because Skype is functioning as that third party, <laughs> but I think it's hard to see the third party. And so I think it's part of the, what's incumbent upon us as theorists is to constantly point that third party out and show that, that detour through the third party isn't almost really a detour at all, but that's the only way you get to the other, the other figure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Cause that's, and, and that's, that's the thing is like when I'm like, I'm giving a talk at the end of the month and, and it's the people who are not Lacanian, but are analysts. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to not use the terminology so much because I want, like, if I say imaginary, people think imagination, you know? Right, so I'm right. just trying to change it a little, like, to the realm of the image or being stuck with the image or something like that to try to uh, get people to understand that we're talking about, like, these kinds of visual cues and not, like, imagination per se, right, and things like right. that. And no, I think it's really important, yeah, to use, yeah. to try to get out of the jargon. Yeah, and I'm even wondering, like, with the phallus and the idea of the phallus, like, you make the argument that, like, there's no point in changing this because it, like, historically makes sense and it's important that Lacan kind of inverted it, the discussion in this way. But also, like, people hear the word phallus and they just, like, run away and they don't even look at what we're talking about. I know. In fact, I never <laughs> use it for that reason. Yeah. So I was right. I wrote that for this essay. And I mean, I think that theoretically, but just practically, I just never use that term as a way of analyzing anything socioculturally. I just never do because for the very reason you just said. Although, interestingly, I do use the term castration. So I'll, I'll often say symbolic castration, but mm -hmm. I will never, ever say phallus. Yeah, just me because, too. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, because I agree. It's like it, you can't just change the name and it's still the same positioning. It, it still right. have the same right. dynamic. So then, like, what are you fooling? But, like, yeah, it makes sense when talking to people who aren't Lacanian psychoanalysts and maybe don't use it because they're not... It's like when you're having a talk with someone or an argument and you say something, you know they're not going to hear the rest of what you said. If you say that word, right. so just don't, right. don't. Right. Be it's the just, bigger it's, person. Right. <laughs> it just in, immediately alienates, it makes your chance of winning the argument or converting them zero. Mm. So there's just no point in it. So I... I I feel that way pretty strongly about the use of phallus, or at least, but I, I mean, it's personal. Like, I understand people that still use it and insist on it. As I said, theoretically, I, I understand that. But I, I do think it's a, it's a doomed argument strategy. So. Yeah, and I think the more, the more too, that, you know, the way the discourse is going, um, you don't want people, yeah, to, like, throw the baby out with the bathwater yeah. and just yeah. be like, psychoanalysis talks about the phallus. Clearly, they're outdated, you know? Right. Right, right, exactly. exactly. Okay, great. What else did I star? Um, yes, well, this is about the phallus. Because the phallus signifies meaning as such, it does not have its own signified. The phallus means at once everything and nothing. Yeah, I like that idea of the signifier without it signified. And I think that's another way that I talk to people about phallus without saying phallus. Like I'll often say that a signifier without a signified, and then I'll just give a brief example of what that might mean. Like a, a word that you use like freedom, you know, like a word that functions as this phallic signifier for us, but doesn't have like, and if I said, what does that mean? People would have a tough time saying what that meant to them. And I think because it means a lot of, it means everything or and nothing. And so I think that, I think that's a, way to say that term without again kind of avoiding saying the term mm, that's a great example it freedom. is i mean I think, yeah freedom really because you know it means it can the funny thing is like donald trump and bernie sanders can both use it very often in their discourse and they'll mean like the totally opposite things totally yeah <laughs> um and what about you talk about how later on Lacan doesn't use uh, phallus so much and kind of switches over to being more focused on objet a. Yeah, I think that's I so so. It's almost in this essay there is, of course, this emphasis on phallus as signifier, but there's also a sense of phallus as what is desired, and that completely changes as the so objet a becomes 
the, the the object that drives our the object cause of our desire. So that shift, I think, is probably more important for. Maybe it's even more important for feminism than anything that Lacan does, because then all of a sudden that that he constructs a way of thinking about desire that's no longer tied to, you know, male or female necessarily at all. Like Abje Ah is sort of indifferent to to sex. And I feel like that's a pretty important step for for the role that psychoanalysis plays in understanding ideology and understanding, you know, social relations and and, and and just an, under, an understanding subjectivity as such so I feel like that's a for me that's a really important shift and I and, and I and that's another reason why I don't talk about phallus because I'm much more invested in objet ah as the as I don't know something like the center of Lacan's system and then you know in seminar 21 he says the objet ah is the one thing that I've invented so I feel like for him it beca- it totally depla- displaces phallus as the as the it's it's hard to call it the center of the system because it's the, it's the, the failure the absence of the center, of the center. <laughs> it's the of the center correct so but it is it is the absence of the center of the system yeah and whereas i think phallus so i think it's it, but it's not a, it's specifically not a signifier so that's why i think phallus can you know continues to play a role because it's a it's it's a signifier whereas object is what is irreducible to signification. So I think that's a, so that, you know, that there's a way in which that move also represents Lacan's turn away from structuralism. Like I think as long as Fallis is at the center of his thinking, then he's still a, very much a Levi Straussian structuralist. But then once it's objet odd, then it's all of a sudden the subject that doesn't fit within the structure. That is the, 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 the focal point of Lacan's, theorizing and thinking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I don't know that much about Kant. Okay. So I would love for you to explain what you're talking about with Kant and anti- okay. antimony. Antinomies, yeah. Antinomies. So I should have explained that better in the essay. Um, so the antinomy, so, so in the critique of pure reason, there's basically uh, three sections. So the first section is the transcendental aesthetic, which talks about um, our sensibility and how we how we receive impressions and our, our intuitions and our sensibility, and the second section is about is called the transcendental uh, analytic, and that explain and in that section Kant explains how our understanding is structured, how we grasp and, and conceptualize the world, and then the third and this is where he talks about the antinomies of pure reason, the transcendental dialectic. So for Kant, Kant re uh, re-empowers the term dialectic or, or brings it back in to focus for the first time really since Plato, but for him dialectic means something negative and it means there are these problems and it's a critique of pure reason because reason for Kant is this faculty that tries to think absolute questions like does the world have a beginning or an end in space and time? Is there a smallest substance or not? Uh, and so uh, in the in the transcendental dialectic, which is this third major section of the critique of pure reason, Kant tries to answer these questions, and his answer is, well, these questions are unanswerable because the result is what he calls these antinomies, and so it, it, it becomes a dialectic, an opposition that cannot be resolved of antinomies. So he thinks that he can prove, like the, the, the first of all, the question, this the first antinomy is, does the world have a, be, a beginning? in space or time. And Kant thinks we can prove both that it doesn't have one and also that it does have one. So he thinks that both answers become are, are not provable, that both can be proved false. And then there are these, so those are what he, what he calls the uh, mathematical antinomies. And then there are these other antinomies, and the main one here is the question about are we free or are we not? Mm. And he thinks, in this case, we can prove both that we are free and that we are not free. But because both can be proven, it's an antinomy. It's, there's no solution to it. So antinomy for Kant means, I think the clearest way you could say it is, it's a problem that has in which both solutions are either correct or both solutions are false. So that's what that's what. Lacan meaning is there's making. no solution. Meaning there's no solution <laughs> at all. Correct. Like life. Right. So, so another way, <laughs> right, which is life. Which, so it's another way of saying contradictions. And I think that, 
that when Hegel, like that's, I, from, as I see it, that's Hegel's starting point for his philosophy are Kant's antinomies of pure reason, and Hegel labels them contradictions. So it's just another way of, of it's another term for contradiction. I think. Yeah, I feel like I feel like that a lot lately. Like anytime I start thinking about anything that's going on societally for too long, I get to a point where I just think there's just no solution. Right, right. Well, that's so for Kant that it was only these ultimate questions that led to antinomies. But I think you could say maybe any sort of cultural problem is is enmeshed in antinomies. Where there's every you think of it one way, you can't solve it. You think of it the other way, you can't solve it either. So that's basically this like that's what antinomy means. Like either way you approach it, you run into a dead end. Yeah, there's things that have, the, like, better or worse kind of outcomes in certain situations, but it's no real answer or solution. No real like, solution, yeah. 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 Hmm. So that's intended. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you, because you just throw these little things out there, and then I'm like, wait, talk about that more. <laughs> That's why I had to call you. Okay. <laughs> um, he said, uh, one cannot trace an uninterrupted... Okay, so you're talking about the like nature versus nurture. It's not all biology or culture kind of right. argument. Right. Um, and you, you already went through biology and why that does not work. So you said, why, one cannot trace an uninterrupted through line from the dialectics of the social order to the desires of individual subjects either, right? Though right. Lacan doesn't mention him, one might say that this is the mistake that Foucault makes in his critique of psychoanalysis in the first volume of The History of Sexuality. Can you talk yes. more about that? Yeah, I can never resist to get again pot shots at Foucault, but and I did it here. Um, so, because even, as I say, Lacan doesn't mention him in the essay. Um, so Foucault's point, and, I, and, and this, is a, this is, I think, comes back to that discussion that we were having about Butler versus Kopchak, because mm -hmm. I think in the, on this question, Butler is Foucauldian, mm -hmm. that Foucault's point is that we can, that there's a direct, like, the, w whatever the law is, it directly produces an effect in subjects that are subjected to it. So, so for him our desire is not something that can can be a desire that 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 challenges the law because our desire is the product of the law so it's not so there's nothing there can be nothing in and this is why he's a culturalist there can be nothing in uh our the way that we desire as subjects that comes that that transcends or challenges or goes beyond the cultural mechanism that produces us as desiring subjects so he thinks that there's there's just a straight causal relationship between those two things. And so what Lacan is getting at, is, and I think this is the point of psychoanalysis, we were even talking about this earlier, is that there's 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 something different about the signifier and about culture. So so the signifier produces us as desiring beings that is and that desire is not just reducible to the culture in which we exist, that there's something that goes beyond. And I think it's also true about law. I was just thinking about this as I was getting ready to talk to you, that that I think for psychoanalysis, law and signification are not reducible to culture, that there's some there's a disjunction between those two things. And that because of that, our desire is never just, you know, it can be like we might we might grow up in a capitalist society and then we might but our our we might be tied to some to some idea of socialism like we can or we can we can grow up in a neighborhood where we're taught to 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 think that any interracial relationship is bad and yet we our desire is for that so the, there there are all these ways in which our desire can break from our cultural the way in which we're culturally constructed but i think the i think the dominant way of thinking in academy today is certainly this cultural constructivism and so i think that that, that for me and indebted to foucault i think foucault is in some way the master thinker of today's at least social science academy and so and humanities and so i so i think that this essay is in, in many ways a, a a challenge to that way of that cultural reductionism mm -hmm. yeah because it's, it's not all biology and it's not all just constructed that's and it's a interaction between 
a lot of things. <laughs> well, I like that idea of the interaction. I, mean, I think that's kind of the psychoanalytic position that that it's this interaction between biology and culture that produces something that can't be reduced to either one. Right. So I think that's really, and which is in some way signified by the signifier itself because it's irreducible to either biology or culture. Right. I yeah. like that. So how do we get that into academia more? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. Keep writing articles. Just keep them. writing. Yeah. Keep that's the solution I found. Writing. No, I don't know. I don't think my arguments have been successful. <laughs> Just keep writing much. and talking to people yeah. and see what happens. That's all we could do, really. Um, is it okay that I just keep going to points? That's fine, totally. Okay, because I start and I mean, I underline so many things. If you saw this, it's like a lot. So I'm just <laughs> trying to pull out some of them. Sure, sure. Um, let's talk about desire. Okay. Um, so you talk, you say that you, you write everything so beautifully. Can I oh, tell thanks. you? Um, so you're talking about, um, the demand that operates through the signifier, which is a demand for love or recognition. And then you said for Lacan, the signifier's primary function is to indicate recognition. And we respond to the demand by meeting the, meeting the needs of the other. Uh, the child cries, the parent provides it for food, etc. But the demand seeks love, not the fulfillment of its needs. The result of this impasse is the emergence of desire, the desire that the phallus signifies. Right. So I think that's pretty. So this is the one time I think this is the first time where Lacan makes this distinction between need, desire and demand, which is pretty important for him. So I think that's another way in which this essay has a, a central place. And maybe that's one of the reasons why they decided to lead off with it, although I'm just speculating. Um, so this idea that that uh, the people respond to our demand it's like we we so first of all this when the child just cries and, and it's a and and the the parent responds with responding to the need of the child to so the need of the hunger of the child that response the problem is that as lacan sees it is that it misses because it's presiding the need it do, it can never fulfill the demand that the child has for love and i think that's a key aspect of this of this a that that our demand, like whatever demand we make of the other, is never properly answered by the other, and it's through that gap. So, because because we're uh, we're articulating the demand through signifiers. So the child maybe is just crying, but that's a signifier. And I may say to to you like, oh, I want to do this uh, podcast at eleven o'clock. But okay, so that I have to articulate that in signifiers. So that you. You have you have to respond to that. In so I how you respond is never going to satisfy what I'm demanding because the signifier can never it, desire doesn't really fit into the signifier. Lacan thinks so. It always there, my desire is always for something beyond that. So it's always for something that can't be captured in the signifier. So what you give back to me never perfectly captures what I desire, and also what I desire is never perfectly articulated in my demand. So I can never really say exactly what I desire, just like you can never fully respond to my desire because it's articulated in, in, in signifiers. So I think that's this, this, in a certain way, this essay is about the failure of signification insofar as it's talking about desire and desires about the failure of signification. Yeah, and that also goes back to what we were talking about earlier with like the problem of being in these dual relationships and therapies, like so, so many different kinds of therapies are just so focused on the dual relationship and they don't understand. It doesn't matter what you tell the patient, <laughs> it's never right. going to be right. <laughs> it's never going to be right, exactly. So just that, stop. <laughs> that idea, which is why, I mean, that is the just Lacan's own justification for his psychoanalytic practice, which is try to embody the object, right? Never, never giving the patient what they want back to them because it's never going to be what they want anyway. Mm. So I think that's really good. What you say. Yeah, it's essential. Okay. Essential. Oh, right here I wrote, okay, I already asked you that, because I wrote, talk about this with an exclamation point. <laughs> um, let's see, let's see, oh, 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 and then to continue that, 
Lacan continues to view the phallus as the signifier of desire, but its importance for explaining desire diminishes. Uh, in sections of signification, the phallus functions not just as a signifier of desire, but also what is desired. You talked about that a little. Yeah, yeah. That, and so that, I think, is the, that that's something that totally drops out. This idea that the phallus is what is desired drops out. And then what I like about the way in which object A gets formulated is it allows Lacan to make this distinction between the object that causes our desire and the object that we desire. And that distinction is not present here. So I think that's an important distinction that'll come later. Yeah, that's huge. Um, should we talk a little bit just for the audience about masculine imposture and feminine masquerade? Sure, I love this. So I have I, my favorite example. So I, I and I'm gonna, I'm stealing this totally from Jennifer Friedlander, who wrote this book called the the Feminine Look, and and, and it was her first book. And and in this book, she says that the the way to distinguish between these two things, so masculine imposture feminine masquerade and she her way of distinguishes between the hat and the toupee that the toupee is the example of masculine imposture so it's it it seems like it's hair it seems like it works but at any moment it could just totally like the wind could catch it and it could fly off and so it could totally fail whereas the hat you know that the person is it's covering up baldness is her example so so the hat you know it's covering up a bald head like you can see i have a hat you can look around the sides of my hat that i'm i'm really bald but because the hat's there i it it does cover over the bald the cast for, she equates baldness with castration um so it does cover over my castration so it's interesting that the male way i think it's pretty great as an example that the male way more successfully covers over castration, but it's also constantly imperiled. Like it could, it could fall apart at any time. And whereas the female way kind of avows, it doesn't disavow, kind of it avows rather than disavowing castration, but it still covers it over. So I think there's a, but, but, it, but it's, it's avowed in the covering. And so I think that's a pretty great way of thinking about that, that kind of opposition. What it means, because if you think about it, if you just think about the terms imposture and masquerade, they might seem like they're just synonymous, you mm -hmm. know, like the same thing. But I think imposture tries to present itself as potent, as really having it, whereas masquerade, there is this implicit avowal of lack in masquerade. And I think that's, and for Jennifer Friedlander's point is that that's the superiority of masquerade as a position. And that's how psychoanalysis in in this sense privileges female subjectivity and masquerade over male subjectivity and imposture. So I think that's a pretty important because I, it's interesting that that I think uh, most people would say most people that we've talked about, Alenka Zubanchik, Joan Kopchak, Jennifer Friedlander would say that psychoanalysis, if there's a privilege on, in it, it's not the privilege of male subjectivity and, and the masculine, it's the privilege is the feminine side. So I think that's a that's an important way of not just defending, but art articulating what psychoanalysis is and what it, and I think Lacan in the Lacanian version, that becomes clearer than in any other version. Yeah, and that goes along with, you, you talk about this little too, like why you can't just get rid of or it's a, there's an argument not to just get rid of the word phallus is because you you have to change your relationship to it. Exactly, exactly. Right, like, more, like, like the stupidest thing would be, let's create a new word identi identified with women that now plays the part the phallus does because the console point is you don't want to be identified with the phallus. That that's, the, that's, the, that's not the privileged. And I think that's, you know, whenever I hear this term like male privilege, I always think, well, Okay, but not really, because the whole point is that position is not really the. I mean, I understand what people are saying when they say that. What they're really saying is, you know, you get you're not suspected of things, you get certain advantage, whatever. But but it's really there's a certain way in which masculine subjectivity is not the privileged position. It's a it's a you're you're at a you're you're at, you're it's a it's a as long as it's a position of imposture, it's it seems like it's privileged. It's not something that we should all aspire to. And I think that's the danger of that privileged language. It makes it seem like that's what we should be aspiring to when I don't think that's the case at all. Yeah, well, that's one of the things I was thinking when I was reading your chapter was because you were talking about the, the phallic position being the 
privileged position or whatever. And I was like, what if you switched out the word phallus, the signifier, for privilege? Because everybody's talking about privilege all the time. Oh, th- you have to recognize your privilege, your privilege and this and that or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> well, I like that. I like that. I mean, I think that that like is the is privilege the privilege signifier? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's yeah, because it's not a great thing to aspire to. Like, and also the phallus, the phallic masculine phallus is like these guys that like the Trumpers right now. These guys are like really angry and beefed up and like red in the face and sweating and like clearly they have some like really underlying weakness or anxiety going on right I mean, or they right, wouldn't be exactly. so like beefed up with their guns and everything you know right right, right. <laughs> I mean, we're talking right in the aftermath of these two deadly shootings and and i think like it's so evident that it's about imposture that leads to the shooting not about phallic power so i think that's that's what's really i think important i mean that, that seems to be the main lesson of psychoanalysis is that we act violently out of imposture, not out of, not out of um, the excess of power or something. Right? Yeah, no, there's nothing underneath. There's nothing holding them up. Right. right. They, they, uh, they're just like, it'll just collapse. Right. And I kind of think that's what we're seeing. <laughs> I definitely think we're seeing it quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. So I was thinking about that though. Maybe, maybe like. When you when you talk to audiences that are more like queer theory based or something like that, um, maybe kind of reframing this idea as like a the privilege, because right. everybody is using that a lot nowadays. Yeah, I agree. Mm. I agree. Um, I think we got to most of these. That's great. Is there anything off the top of your head that you want to talk about? Well, I thought, I just think this is interesting. I, I don't know how, what I want to make of it, but that it's Lacan's only decree that was written in German initially. Right. You know, so it's, I mean, I think it's impressive that he was able to write it in German and he gave it as a talk in German. And, and you know, and then so this is a translation of it. So I find that interesting that it's the one that's, I mean, he ne- didn't write any in English. In, I mean, his German was, I think, better than his English, but... um I don't know. I find that just, it's just maybe that's one of the reasons why they chose to begin with it too. Cause do you know of, who this group was that he spoke to? The Max Planck Society in Munich? No. no. I'm curious. I'll have to see if I can figure that out. Yeah. Um, and what about the, the fact that he was, he gave this when he uh, was doing the fifth seminar, Formations of the Unconscious? Yeah, I think that I mean, I, so I and I think I talk about this in um, in the essay that that in that seminar, he talks about the difference between imaginary and symbolic phallus. And that's a dis- I, it's it's curious to me that he doesn't make that distinction here, because I think that's pretty that really helps to explain his understanding of castration in a distinct way from other psychoanalysts and that what you're losing in castration is something you never really had. And I think this the idea that you lose you don't lose the real phallus, you lose the imaginary phallus. And I think that really is that the symbolic phallus is a signifier, but that the object that you lose is just this imaginary phallus and in castration. I think that's really good. And I think that, you know, I think that's another we were talking about what separates Lacan from other psychoanalytic theorists. That, I think, is a big one that that he doesn't think you've lost anything. There's no initial. I don't know what you would like. He would call it like pure jouissance or or any no f- no initial state of fulfillment. Like the 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 child at the mother's breast is not in a state of perfect satisfaction. That then the loss of the breast causes you to to give up. And I think that to me that's one of the most important things that he contributes. This idea that there's no initial plenitude, and that initial plenitude is itself an illusion, a fantasy, and that. Uh, so that loss is constitutive for us. It, like we're constitutively lacking subjects. I feel like that is the, I mean, I'm tempted to say almost that's his main contribution, that idea. So yeah, I then, think that. Because this yeah. idea that, that, yeah, that there was this like oneness or the mother or whatever, it's completely imaginary. Right. It's completely right. That's the term I was avoiding using, but yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> Not in the Lacanian imaginary. The other right. Imaginary. I know. It, Maybe in both. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. 
it, it's really imaginary. And even I used to work at this HIV clinic in Brooklyn. And, you know, because I used to think of it as like, oh, well, you separate from the mother at birth. But then, like, an HIV clinic in Brooklyn, uh, you know, if I, I work specifically with all the children who are HIV positive and mm. pregnant women, all the mothers. Um, and, you know, if the woman was HIV positive, she could take the medications and have the baby come out negative. Um, oh, wow. Because the baby forms their own immune system in utero. So they're already separated. So they're already separated in utero. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. Mm. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, anything else? Have I racked your brain enough? No, it's been great. It's been so <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. great. It's such. I mean, I know this was a ton of work. It's such a thorough it was, essay. I I think I probably if they asked me to do it today, I probably wouldn't do it. <laughs> Because it was just so much like it just took a lot of time for, you know, it's like just a, it's not really a passion of mine. I mean, I'm happy to do it. But at the time I was happy to do it. But I think that in retrospect, I would have said no. I no, it's to. a ton of work. You can tell. How did you get did you get assigned to the signification of the phallus? I think they had a they had eliminated a few of them mm -hmm. and there were some that were left. And I, I just thought it was the most interesting one that was left. From mm, interesting. That's a good thing to think about how each person got the one they were assigned. I mean, the, whoever got to choose first, they got the, <laughs> so I think the first, I think the Danny Nobis, he picked Conan. He did Conan Saad, yeah. And, and yeah. So I think he might've got the first choice. Cause I would imagine, uh, Convex sod and, and, and subversion of the subject and dialect of desire, I would imagine those would be the two most in demand. Although subversion of the subject is so long that I, this took me forever to write. I can imagine how long that would take somebody to, to get through. Mm -hmm. No, you've well, done a ton of work. Yeah. yeah. What were you going to say? I'm just going to say the subversion essay has less of these oblique sentences where one sentence forces you to, to you know, I would, I would, I would spend a day of research on one or two sentences, and that was that. That was a quite a, it was costly and instrumental. No, I believe it. Um, oh, this is interesting as well. Freud. Let's talk about Freud. Okay. Because um, you talk about though he had no knowledge of modern linguistics, Freud reveals the psychic resonance of the division between the signifier and signified that Saucer and other linguists insist on. Yeah, I think that, so Lacan makes a lot out of that, that Freud did not, even though Saussure and Freud were contemporaries, so that he, but the fact that the, the course on uh, structural linguistics is, is, or course on general lingu linguistics is, is published only posthumously, so Freud had no access to it. And so Lacan makes a lot out of that. But it's interesting that, I think it maybe comes through most in the joke book, the mm -hmm. jokes in the relationally unconscious that he has a sense of the signifier and the dream book, obviously too. And, and, and maybe this, the pathology, psychopathology of everyday life, these books show that he's really attuned to how the signifier is a carrier for desire. And I think that's the thing that, you know, Lacan really makes central for him, his own project. But I think, you know, Freud, even though he didn't have linguistics at the hand, he still had a sense of that through, I guess, just through paying attention to patients. But I mm -hmm. think also just through his, just the way his theoretical antenna were, were attuned that he managed to, like, why would you think that jokes were important? Like, that's, a, it's, it's just kind of, like, I don't think there's anything in analysis that made him think that, but there's something that gave him the intuition that jokes are important. And then that made him, and once he started to look at jokes, I think what's fascinating about that, like jokes that, that for him, the pun is the, is the, I don't know what you would call it, like the, the paradigmatic form of the joke. Mm -hmm. And, and, and why would he recognize that? Like what and allowed him to recognize that? Well, maybe it's the fact that he's attuned to desire and the way desire works. And then he, that just naturally made him look at signification and the way the signifier works. I don't, I don't know. But that's a, I find that interesting, just open problem. And, and you know, Lacan, like the whole need for the return to Freud is probably because Freud himself wasn't able to articulate things in terms of the signifier and, and signification in the way that Lacan was able to.
Yeah, exactly. And I kind of was able to take like what people had learned since then and were talking about in his more modern times and then like apply it to what Floyd was saying retrospectively. I mean, I think that's true. Although I I do also think that if it wasn't for Lady Strauss, that he wouldn't have made that turn like that, that he it's not just the publication of of Saussure. It's also that Levi Strauss really brought that brought linguistics in and structural linguistics into um, social sciences. And then mm-hmm. he, just, and he just was very impactful on Lacan's end development. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to look at the jokes book again, because I'm writing a book right now called Scansion in Psychoanalysis and Art. So I'm looking a lot at like dream book and psychopathology of everyday life, but I haven't yeah. re-brought out the wit book. Yeah, those three, I think, are the three ones Key. where the signifier is, yeah, is mm-hmm. more right front and center. Yeah. Yeah, and it speaks to, like, why Alenka's odd one in is such a gem. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> the same so, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I just don't want you to leave and then uh, me go, oh, no, let me ask you this. <laughs> Regrets, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, this, too, is so great. Um. The subject doesn't simply speak, but the passion of the signifier speaks through the subject. Here Lacan calls this passion it, which is also the id, right? Can right. we talk about that? Yeah, I would love to talk about that. So I, mm. I think this notion that something speaks through me, I think is really, like, I think that's central. Again, I think that's part of the non-structuralist version of Lacan, like, because... For structuralism, there's just the structure and it's determinative. And and this it or this thing that speaks through me is a is a passion that gets I think he, he would say it almost gets it gets draped on signifiers or stuck to them. And so they get they get charged just like the way we talked about freedom earlier, that's a signifier that gets charged with a lot of passion that once you start to use it, like that speaks through you. Even if you're yourself the dullest person, not passionate at all, and I think that's kind of interesting. I I love this idea of the, I mean, the the idea that the the, the Freud's id that das s mm-hmm. is also is the it, and I think that's a kind of I think I almost feel like I know Freud approved the Strachey's standard edition of his works, and so that he approved every translation. But I really feel like understanding uh, the way passion worked and the way psychoanalysis theorized things, it would have been so much better if it was known as the it. Mm -hmm. And because then it it would just be like, oh, that's what I feel when I feel totally this thing inside me that I can't control. It's it speaking or it's, it's taking control of me. So I really, that's one of those cases where I think the translation is very, the other one is of course, this is very famous is Treb as a translation for instinct and rather than straight, you did not use the term drive, but this is, I think one of the saddest translations because I really feel like, because it doesn't say anything to people. They just, mm-hmm. it just, and it gets bandied about in cultural analysis as something that just doesn't mean anything. But I think it like that, it inside of me, I think they, people would really, that would really resonate with people. So exactly. I feel like that. Yeah. I think that's a real missed opportunity of, in translation. Yeah, Yeah, because everybody would be like, oh, yeah, I know know that experience. (laughs) Exactly. But you talk about what the id, and then they'd be like, "What? I don't know what that is. It's too abstracted, and it has no meaning, you know, it has no meaning otherwise. Right, it's not an English word, really. Yeah, there's nothing to connect to it. Right. Um, And same thing with drive, like instinct, that just brings it back to biology, and people think biology, biology, but that's not what he's talking about. Right. I mean, it again, it's just just what you said earlier about this collision between culture and biology. That's what drive is. It's a it's the result of that collision. And so if you translate tree by instinct, then you've just you've just missed that altogether. Yeah. Then you're thinking I'm hungry or it's like a reflex when the doctor like hits my knee or, <laughs> you know, I need to procreate or whatever. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like leaving it on the end. Is there anything else you want to talk about? No, I, it is a good, it's a good starting point or a good the end. It. But he's like, I, just, I just said it's a good starting point. That was must be I'm really enjoying it. Right? 
<laughs> it's the opposite of Freud, the way he introduces the joke book, which the guy says, I want to end this session of Congress when he means to say, I want to begin this session. Of Congress. <laughs> I just did the opposite. Of that. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks, Vanessa. That was really fun. Thank you. You're the best. Okay. <laughs> Here. Bye. Okay. Bye. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Todd McGowan. For more, please visit our website at renderingunconscious.org for links to Dr. McGowan's books as well as the Reading Lacan's Acre series. You can also visit Vermont dot academia dot edu slash Todd McGowan for more information or my website Dr. Vanessa Sinclair dot net Rendering Unconscious is also a book Rendering Unconscious Psychoanalytic Perspectives Politics and Poetry Please visit our publisher's website trapart dot net that's T R A P A R T dot net Please support the podcast at our Patreon. You can find the link below or visit www.patreon.com slash V-A-N-E-S-S-A 23-C-A-R-L. Gifts and crass emotions. The shadows have, therefore, the first of paradoxical action in bring it. They take a hand, imploring it on the streets and on their neighbors. There is a regular water carnival in which all participate without distinction of rank or station. Streams of the water flow from the windows and roofs onto the head of the and reconstructive techniques engineer the problem as a kind of conservatism that ethical consideration for them Cosmetic. Often those who are remembered as we, the memory of the ordinary individual persists. Note, the ego is ultimately from the surface of the body. A generation of artists and authors as far as far as as Russia and South America. Today his works are all but forgotten, encounter only within treaties on the decade or in brief reference in academic studies. The majority of these references tend to perpetuate the wonder I wonder sometimes what the frequency of my body, if it is my body that haunts me, or outside sources. What is the frequency of all that haunts you? What is the frequency of an ancestor's rage? She's made friends with the devil. They say she's a witch, she's a witch. My enemies tears. My life, I'm not in my head. I'm someplace in the world. The stage, 
and it's something it's I've always had, always had. Beginning stages, and things often felt like a, they became increasingly authored. I would, I would. The types that I saw in dreams would create with household objects, bits of these gloved hands braced on the. The chapel, the chapel is empty, is empty.